Hello there. I'm Carl Ulrich. I'm the Vice Dean of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Wharton School. And I first wanted to start by saying Happy New Year. <laughs> we, we, are th we have a great turnout tonight. And our theory is that everyone woke up on January 1st and said, you know, I really need to learn about how to scale my venture. And so I'm going to sign up for Wharton Scale School. This is our, remarkably, this is our seventh Wharton Scale School event. Most of you, many of you have been here for many of the other uh, of the other six, but let me just give a very quick overview of the big idea. The big idea is that many universities have rushed into the business of incub what we call incubating the fruit flies, getting new ventures started. And we really feel like while that's a super exciting thing to do, and we do it very well at Wharton, that Wharton occupies a unique position that allows us to use our very Whartonness, the things that we're great at, analytics, finance, marketing, uh, and apply operations, apply those things to the challenge of how you take a product, a company that has found product market fit and scale it to be an enterprise of tremendous value. And so we coined this term Wharton Scale School, and we've convened these events to bring our, mostly our alumni experts in front, of, uh, in front of all of you to share expertise about scaling new ventures. The topics we've covered have been, the first one we did was we, we've done one on, on scaling sales, on using analytics in scaling, on scaling talent, on connecting strategy with execution, and, and this one on scaling through acquisition, large, broadly speaking, scaling, scaling through acquisition. By the way, we, are, we plan to continue these, and so if you have ideas for another topic you'd really like to see us address, we'd love to hear them. So just reach out to me or, or any, any of our staff. I want to recognize Irina Yen here. Irina, stand up. Irina is champions and leads our Scale School Initiative. It's done a terrific job on all of this. And also Allison Grant, who is always hidden because she doesn't like the spotlight at all, but she's the one who really makes the event happen. And so let's give a big round of applause to both Irina and, and Allison. Uh, tonight, we, the, the format of Scale School we found that works really well is we have a faculty leader in the subject area that convenes a panel and moderates a discussion, gives a little framework and then, and then moderates a discussion. And so my job is now to introduce our, our moderator and he will in turn introduce our panel. Mm -hmm. So we're super lucky to have with us the dapper Dave Wessels right here. And uh, Dave Wessels is one of the most popular faculty members in the Wharton School. His, his course might be, I didn't actually look at the data, but I think it's the highest rated course at the Wharton School. Uh, he's a professor in the finance department and has an incredibly distinguished record, starting with a degree from our management and technology program in, from computer science in Wharton. He then went on to have a, a, a career at McKinsey and uh, uh, got a PhD and came back uh, to, to teach at Wharton. Among Dave's uh, many accomplishments, he also has, and I just checked this today, the top-selling book on corporate valuation, really the Bible of corporate valuation. So, and, and his course, which is Venture Capital and the Finance of Innovation, is really also quite central to the themes we're here, <laughs> we have here. So let's welcome Dave Wessel. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you setting the expectations low. All right, so, uh, so first of all, uh, welcome back. Welcome home to many of you who, uh, who've graduated and are, are rejoining us. I see many familiar faces, uh, some of my own, my own students uh, in the audience. Many of my teaching assistants are here as well. So it's uh, exciting to see so many people come back home and what a wonderful place Wharton San Francisco is. Uh, we you know, obviously have the home school back in Philadelphia, but I, I tell every one of my students who's interested in venture or tech that they've got to get out here because the ecosystem is just unparalleled. And I wish we could create the same kind of ecosystem back in Philadelphia. I know there are folks that are trying to do it um, with, for instance, first round capital, but it's really hard. I mean, building an ecosystem takes generations and to have this in San Francisco and to be part of this hub is, is fantastic. Um, from my perspective today, I'm the school part of Scale School. Um, so just for a few moments, I'm gonna show you a couple slides uh, about uh, how I think about mergers and acquisitions. 
And I tried to, you know, I try and tilt it towards a younger company, but really I don't make a distinction. I'm always just thinking about sort of what's the role of mergers and acquisitions to make your company successful. And so I just want to show you a few slides uh, to get the conversation started. And for those of you who have taken my class, you're going to see some familiar stuff because uh, some of the core stuff that I think about uh, is, is the North Star for me. It just doesn't change. And what that's all about, given my background in finance, is really the link between corporate strategy and, and, uh, and value creation. And so I want to start, start there because that's the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do with these organizations is how do you build a successful entity that's going to be able to compete over long periods of time. So with that said, uh, I'll get started with a few slides and then I'll bring our panel up uh, to talk about this from a more practical perspective. So the first thing I just want to remind everybody uh, is uh, what drives value creation. So from my perspective, there are three things that really drive value creation. And when you're doing an acquisition, I think at the end of the day, you, you really want to drive value creation with the acquisition. So what are the three things that we're continually thinking about? And a lot of this uh, comes out of my work, not just here at Wharton, but also out of McKinsey as well. Number one, you have to drive revenue growth. And you guys here in San Francisco, you think that's easy. Um, and it is for many entrepreneurial startups, but for most large companies around the world, growing the business in a zero inflation environment in which you already have a global footprint is, is nearly impossible. Companies that are growing at two or 3% per year almost consider that to be a success. And especially uh, with American companies today bringing foreign revenues home with the change in the dollar versus let's say the euro, many companies have been shrinking for the last couple of years uh, once you take into account foreign exchange rates. So number one, we've got to help our companies grow. Number two, you have to earn a healthy return on capital. And a lot of M&A is around this, right? How do you put two organizations together and sort of squeeze out margin, squeeze out capital, make things more efficient? And then the final piece, uh, and that's a little bit what today's about, is how do you build an organization that's sustainable over long periods of time? And that's what I think is probably the most difficult. We have tons of great tools here at the business school, many of them developed by Carl, around how you grow your business. We have great tools around how to uh, drive great returns on capital, including some of the work from the finance and accounting departments. The one thing I don't think we've really unlocked yet is sustainability. How do you drive a sustainable organization? It's very hard for companies to pivot from sort of one sort of generation to the next. And my students often ask me, give me examples of companies that have been able to do it. And unfortunately, the examples usually are very narrow uh, in length because most companies really are sort of one product wonders. All right, so from an acquisition perspective, what are we talking about? Let me introduce you to a study um, that was done at a McKinsey and Company. And for me, it's one of the studies that resonates the most with uh, senior executive teams. It's a study called the granularity of growth. And what the team at McKinsey did was they, they looked at a number of companies, a few hundred, and they got really specific about what drives the difference in growth rates across the three companies. And what they found is as follows. Number one. They found that 5% of the 8% can be attributed to something that they call portfolio momentum. So what this means is on a very granular basis, your submarkets are growing. They have a natural momentum to them. Number two, it's about capturing share. That's another half percent, and that was share. And then finally, the last piece was M&A, around 3% from M&A. But what was also interesting about this study is they called this the three pistons of growth, right? Where, I call it where, share, and M&A. The three pistons, when companies were able to be best in class versus their peers in all three of these pistons, that's when they saw best in class stock price performance. And literally, as you pulled away one of these pistons, the stock price performance of the companies dropped. And so it's interesting to think about these three things when you're trying to drive growth within your business. Number one, how do I continually, as a senior leader, pivot towards momentum? How do I make sure that I'm in momentum markets? And again, that sounds trivial, but as we'll see in just a moment, some markets have momentum and some markets don't. And if your organization's not pivoting, you can find yourself in trouble. Number two, probably the hardest is to, is to capture share. Consistently capturing share, though, is awfully difficult to do. And that's because your competitors are pretty smart. And anytime you have an innovation, they're going to do their best, if it's a great innovation, to copy that innovation. And then number three is mergers and acquisitions, M&A. Now, this 3% here is a little unfair because this 3% is actually the combination of companies. So as an example, if I have a $100 million company that's not growing, 
and it buys another $100 million company that's not growing, I now have what, Peter? My teaching assistant, you better get this right. A $200 million company. <laughs> He's always a front row kind of guy, too. I like that. A $200 million company that's not growing. So this is a little unfair when we say this M&A, but I do think it's important because often M&A will help us in that top category, which is how do we pivot uh, towards growth? All right, so let's continue the discussion. What do I mean by momentum versus no momentum markets? So imagine for a moment that you work for a chipset company, right? So you make chipsets that go into all kinds of devices. It turns out that you're in two markets, one in which you have a very large scale uh, share, which has been part of your business for a long period of time, and one which is relatively small. The first one that you sell chipsets into is called the set-top box, right? It's the cable box that goes on top of your television. The bottom one is the wireless chipset. You've made your name in the top one. That's the market that you're currently in. Now, when we looked up the data, it said that the market was going to grow at 2% per year, which is pretty anemic for a tech space. But I'm not even convinced it's going to grow at 2% a year. I mean, uh, realistically, if we take a look at the year 2030, how many of you think we're going to have a cable box that sits on top of your television that decodes cable? So to grow at 2% a year is probably pretty aggressive. I probably don't have to tell you the trends that are involved with wireless, right? Wireless, of course, and mobile is taking over the world. But imagine that you have positions in both of these things. Imagine that the majority of your position is in the top one. You're just not growing. The question is, how do you pivot towards momentum? So if you're in the top space, how do you actually pivot, in this case, to the bottom space? Now, what do we mean by trends? Well, let's take the set-top box. What's cons one consumer trend that's causing the set-top box to go away? Cutting the cord, right? Uh, in my, uh, my son and I, uh, uh, my older son, uh, who, by the way, was recently admitted to Penn, early admit. <laughs> So next generation, third generation Penn, we're very proud. Uh, he was out doing college tours, looking at some of the other places. You've heard of those schools. And so his 14-year-old uh, brother and I were home uh, uh, alone, and we tried to turn on the television and realized neither of us knew how to. <laughs> and I said to my younger son, I said, you're a 14-year-old boy. You, you have, by law, have to know how to turn on a TV, right? 14-year-old boys, they consume, they consume video 24-7. But what I realized is he's actually never watched our TV. He never watches it, because what does he do? He consumes video 24-7, but where? On his, on his mobile phone. He watches uh, YouTube videos, right? Again, not my cup of tea, but it's what he does. And he's just part of that trend, right? Now, I don't think that trend's going away. So, so here you are, your company, you do set-top boxes. That market's going away, you've got to pivot. And so let's say that you want to pivot into a new market. You don't have a very large presence in wireless, but you need to pivot there. And so the question is, what kind of skills, and this is where I'm getting back into M&A, what kind of skills and capabilities are you going to need to be successful in this new market? This idea of pivoting towards growth. So let's just talk about physical characteristics of the chipset for just a moment. That's not what capabilities are. They're much broader than that. But I think in an audience like this, it's easiest to think about physical characteristics. So imagine for a moment, uh, you're about to pivot into wireless chipsets. What do you have to be world class at from a physical characteristic about these chips? Give me something. Well, manufacturing, but I'm talking about physical characteristics of the chip, right? It's got to be small, right? So it's going to be small and light. So I'm going to write this one on the right hand side. Now, the reason I'm going to write it on the right hand side is imagine that you've been a set top box company for years. So that's sort of the market that you've been in. And imagine a young engineer comes into your office and says, hey, boss, I've got this amazing new innovation that allows us to make our chipset half the size and half the weight. But it's going to make our set-top box 25% more expensive, and it's going to require another $10 million of investment. A very tactical thinker, and we have lots of them in finance, right, sort of linear tactical thinkers, who's been in this old market for a generation, who's been in this set-top box company for the last 15 years, building high-tech chipsets for set-top boxes, doing very advanced stuff. What's that linear thinker going to think? Why are they going to think no? 
Well, it's expensive. It's going to make this commodity product more expensive. Why else? Why else do we not care about a small, light? It doesn't need to be small and light. Why not? It just sits there, right? And so that tactical thinker who isn't thinking about pivoting towards growth lets that capability atrophy. Does that make sense? What's another one? Give me one other. Durable. It's got to be durable. I don't know where I should put that one. Part of me thinks I should put that one on the right. What else? Give me another one. It's got to be low power, right? How many of you watch your iPhones die at 2 p.m. every afternoon? <laughs> and we don't know why that occurs. <laughs> So now we know. So low power, how about a few others, one or two others? It's got to have wireless, what else? It's got to have competitive price. Let me put competitive price over here. So what I'm doing right now, and, and I, I believe this is fundamental for M&A, is we're starting with strategy, right? Where are we currently and where do we want to go? What markets are we in and where do we want to pivot to? Right now, again, this is thinking holistically about the business. The reason I've writ um, written what I have on in the left and the right, and I don't know if this is the place it should be because durability, I, I wasn't sure which one to write. The stuff on the right is the stuff that you're maybe not likely to have given where you've been in the past. It's a capability that you're lacking. And one of the questions that you have to ask yourself is as you want to pivot into these new markets, these new markets are going to require capabilities. Do you want to build them internally? or do you want to acquire them? Now we also have a lift list on the left. Can you see what the difference is between the list on the right and the list on the left? What's the list on the left about? What was on the yeah, I don't know if it's what was. It probably is what was and what even might continue to be. I would argue, and again, maybe these aren't the right places for these things, I would argue that in order to be successful in the old market, you had to have a competitive cost structure. In order to be successful in the new market, you have to have a competitive st cost structure with world-class manufacturing. <laughs> and so the stuff on the left is what you're currently good at. The stuff on the right is the things that you need to get better at as you try and pivot into these new markets. How long do we want the list on the left? How long do we want the list on the left? Well, I mean, you want it to be at least not zero. Because if you're looking at pivoting into this new market and you can't think of any skills that you currently have that you're best in class at, and you're about to pivot into this new market, it's not clear that you're going to be successful at making that jump. On the right-hand side, how long do we want that list? I mean, I, the answer is I don't know. It requires judgment, but I can tell you what I don't want to see is I don't want to see that list being empty. Because typically, if that list on the right is empty, the new skills you, you need to have as you pivot into new markets, if that's empty, it's usually because the team hasn't done an aggressive search of, of sort of what it takes to be successful. You know, I've done enough of these, these strategy studies where we look at M&A, we look at the make versus buy decision, that often if we have nothing on the right-hand side, it just, uh, it just means we don't know the customer well enough. And so you're looking for that richness on both sides. On the left-hand side, you want to have something you can leverage on the right-hand side of course, this is the sophistication that you understand about the new, the new side, okay? Now, this is like holistic, large company M&A strategy. I tried to think about how this would apply on a more tactical level if you were a smaller company. And so again, I'm trying to push towards growth. And so let me give you a couple other things to think about. So this is a little bit more of a tactical view of M&A than a strategic view of M&A. If our goal is to grow the business, the question becomes, how do we use mergers and acquisitions right, to do a couple things? And again, I'm coming at this from a finance frame. There's no question about it. My training's in finance, and so I'm thinking about value creation, how I grow the business. And what I'm borrowing from, actually, is, is the marketing literature, and I'm almost thinking about this like customer lifetime value. You'll sort of see a little bit of customer lifetime value sprinkled in here. So how do I use M&A, how do I use internal innovation to do a couple things with my existing customers? If we think about revenue, it's quantity times price. So just as an example, quantity might be, you know, how do I use M&A or how do I use internal development to develop new products and services that I can sell to my existing customers? Right? So this is almost like a cross-selling perspective. That would be from a quantity perspective. From a price perspective, how can I use internal innovation or external M&A 
to improve the quality and satisfaction of my existing users with my existing products. Maybe there's a new feature. Will that allow me to increase my price? Right? Now remember, m and within a, a, a regulatory standpoint, you've got to be very careful. You, you can't just put two companies together and increase prices because you've reduced competition. Right? That's illegal. So what we're really talking about here is, I want to increase price because it's going to increase margin, but I've got to do that through a better quality product. So what companies out there can actually help me provide a better product, uh, quality product to my customers? From a duration standpoint, boy, wouldn't it be nice if they didn't attrit so quickly? From an attrition perspective, how do I make my existing customers stick here? Right? How do I keep them in the fold for longer periods of time? So again, for those of you who've graduated recently and taken a Pete Fader class or two, right, this, this screams customer lifetime value. But I think that from an M&A, from a tactical perspective, I think this is a nice framework to draw from. From a new customer perspective, how do we acquire new customers for our existing products? Right? So it's not just about keeping your existing customers happy, it's also about bringing new customers into the fold. And the final piece that I just want to remind you of is this piece of uh, internal development. Internal development versus M&A. It's the historic make versus buy decision. Right? For each of these new capabilities that we're going to build, whether they be strategic and big picture, like we had on the previous slide, where we have a CEO who's looking to migrate their business into a new momentum segment, or whether it be more tactical in that you're just trying to make your business more successful, you know, a few hundred users at a time, do we make it or do we buy it? Well, what do you guys think? What's one of the reasons why you want to make it? Make it meaning develop it internally. Go back to that previous slide. I like to have those capabilities on the screen, right? Go back to this idea of, okay, we got to make this chip low power. We've never tried to make the chip low power before. Why not? We've always been in set-top boxes. Why haven't we made it low power? It's plugged into the wall. So we've never had to do that. So we're missing this capability to be successful in this new market. So do we make low power? Do we put a set of 100 engineers on this? Or do we go out and we acquire this capability that we're missing? This make versus buy decision, of course, is so incredibly important. How about over here? Yeah, please, Jay. All right, so if we talk about one make versus buy criteria, it's speed, right? How quickly do we need to move? are we missing out on an opportunity, right? If the market is shifting faster than we can actually develop it internally, then maybe this is something that we have to go out and acquire. So one of the nice things about acquisition, of course, is speed. Anything else for make versus buy? Please? If it's, you mean it's not available from a competitor either? From that perspective, I think you probably have to develop it internally, that capability. If you scoured the market and you just don't believe anybody truly is world class, that might be an opening for you to actually take that on, upon yourself. So that might be one for acquire, yeah? Interesting. How so? Give me a little bit more on that. Well, to a certain extent, though, right? I'm bringing, if I'm, if I, if I'm the one acquiring another company, I'm bringing those internally as well but they're already pre-made for me. So I get the speed of bringing them in quite quickly, and I might be able to still control that. But you're right, there might be other players that have left those firms, or, or maybe that knowledge is out there, yeah? Yeah, I mean, one of the problems with acquisitions, and I have a few slides on it, but I won't show you today, the news is not good when it comes to acquisition, right? If you take a look at almost 40 years of data, the larger the acquisition is, the tougher it is to create value. And I personally think that most of that comes down to deal heat, where people are just so excited at the end of the acquisition to sort of buy something that the prices start to get out of control. And so your initial investments become quite high. And the data is pretty consistent across all decades when we take a look at it. So as much as I'd like to say that we can keep it in check, very often you can't. Yeah? Many times Absolutely. And one of the nice things about acquiring it is you can already see what you're buying, right? So I agree with you there. So that's one on the acquisition side. 
So we have speed, we have certainty. How about a top row? Yeah, second. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to repeat yourself and I'll, I'll say again what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you can almost leapfrog right to the next generation. Again, I keep in back of my mind this low power, right? Imagine that you don't have the world-class capability and low power. Do you go out there and do you buy it or do you develop it internally? And you're right, maybe this allows you to leapfrog another generation. Yeah, have, the, yeah please. Like a, electro, electronic part. Yeah. And then another solution instead of electricity, like electric vehicles, like low power, like a longer uh, Right. And, the and think about the judgment it's going to require. How about one more over here? Yeah. I, I just have a quick question based on your Please. No, the, the, the lack of value creation. The lack of value creation. Because very often we see failure, we also have issues like integration, right? From, from a more strategic okay. perspective. At the end of the day, the amount of premium that most companies end up paying, especially when they're doing the acquisition of a public company, is just too high to actually generate the value. And I think one of the problems for that, maybe I'll close out this session by talking a little bit of finance. I just can't help myself. I really want to talk mostly strategy, uh, given the room. But let's talk about pricing for just a moment. One of the, the bugs that I, that I always struggle with is the following. When you sit with a board of directors, very often when you get into a pricing conversation, this is what you see. My uh, former analysts who come back to get their MBAs, they've seen this a few million times. This is a comps table. And very often the board of directors sits with the comps table in front of them and has a discussion. Half the discussion is strategic, the one that we just had. Where are we currently? Where do we want to pivot? From a strategic perspective, is it a brand new business? From a more tactical perspective, is it just something that we're missing that will help make our customers stickier or will add new features or will help us, you know, let's say, grow the share of their wallets? Very often, this is what we look at. The problem with this table is this table uh, lacks a connection to the real operating metrics of the business. It's amazing how devoid we get between those two. One of the things that I try and push my own students to do is to tie some of these metrics back to real operating statistics. What do these numbers mean? Because it might mean, when we talk about, for instance, trading at a multiple of, of revenue, you're thinking about buying a company at three times revenue. Its revenue is three million, you're thinking about paying nine, that's three times revenue. And so we often get into these debates at the board level. Should we pay three? Should we pay 3.2? Is that fair? And one thing that the bankers do a great job of it is they tell us what the market is willing to bear. But what they don't take responsibility for, and I'm not even convinced it's their job, is they don't necessarily tie it back to real operational metrics. What do these things mean? What do we need to believe around our strategy in order to make these numbers a reality? So remember that slide I had on the tactical aspects of M&A? We said, look, maybe we can do an acquisition that will help us expand our product portfolio to generate more revenue per customer. Maybe it will help us make our customers stickier. What do we need to believe for every time we increment that multiple? And often we don't have those conversations. It might mean that if we actually had you know, one of our MBA students run the model for you, that your average customer would have to go from an 18 month, let's say lifespan, to a seven year lifespan for every point of EBITDA that you pay to get the model to work. So one of the things that I would recommend as you try and keep some of these prices in check, because I, you know, again, I really believe that's a big part of why M&A fails to create value. I really do believe M&A is good for the company. I believe it allows you to move quickly. I believe it allows you to get in new places that you haven't been before, new capabilities. The question is, at what price do you pay? And I think the way that you can sometimes keep that price in check is by having real operational metrics at the table. 
And one last thing I'll just make a comment on. I always find it amazing that to get an internal capital approval, you often have to go through five, six, 10 levels, and any one of those levels can knock you out. But M&A is often right there in corp dev reporting to the CFO and CEO and board. And so there's less of that no culture. And so the question is, do we have that team robustly getting in there and putting real operational statistics around what you need in order to make it successful? You look unconvinced. <laughs> Yeah, you know, one of the nice things, so again, I, I have a few slides on this, but I, I really want to bring our panelists up. Um, so let's talk for just a moment about, about what you're saying. Uh, one of the nice things about private companies is they are absolutely sometimes looking for things that public companies are not looking for, namely liquidity, right? If I could come back, you know, again, I'd probably come back as my French bulldog because she lives a wonderful life. But, <laughs> If I could come back, I'd probably come back as a roll-up specialist. Because if you take a look at some of the wealthiest people in the world, they did roll-ups. Basically what they did was they went to small private companies, let's say third generation private companies in which the fourth generation doesn't want to take over. They come in and they say, you know what? I'm going to offer you 80 cents in the dollar for your company. Now if you said that to a publicly traded company, what would they say back? They'd say it's called plus 40% over the market price. Look at the data, right? So you go in at 80 cents on the dollar, but this is the key, I'll pay cash. And they're thinking the number one thing they want is liquidity and they can't get it elsewhere. One of the problems of a public company is you can't offer that to them. You offer them cash, a shareholder in a public company can get cash any day by just selling their shares. And so I agree with you. I think there's something to be said for purchasing a private company, but that's not the only reason. There's another reason as well, it's called the free rider problem by Grossman and Hart. And what it basically shows is the nice thing about a private company negotiation is there's usually a person across the table who has a lot to lose. And so you get into negotiation with that person and you know that they don't really want to walk away. And so you have a little bit more leverage because you know it's going to be painful if you walk away. When you buy a public company, everybody wants to call what's free riding. They want to be the person that sort of gets tagged along with the deal. And so you lose, that, you lose that ability of sort of that loss. And so I agree with you. I think there's something to be said for keeping the prices in check with privately held companies. But I think the most important point is I'd like to come back as my French bulldog because she lives a wonderful life. All right. Fair enough. All right. I think it's time to bring up our panelists. So we'll, we'll bring them up uh, to come on up, guys. So thank you very much to our panelists for coming in today. Let me, um, let me introduce them uh, from, uh, from my left. I guess that would be your right. Um, Vicente de Baca, uh, in addition to graduating from Wharton in 2009, also graduated from Princeton. I've heard of that school. It's pretty nice. Close neighbors to Princeton. Yeah, close neighbors. Princeton's boring, but that's OK. <laughs> uh, he started at Ad, Ad Knowledge uh, in Corp Dev. In fact, um, many of our panels here have a lot, just a uh, tremendous amount of Corp Dev experience. Uh, Marquito uh, went to Andreessen Horowitz, and now is uh, on his own as a partner at V2 Ventures. Uh, if we keep going to the right, uh, Anton uh, Heinbrink uh, graduated from WashU and then got his MBA here at the Wharton School in 2004. Uh, started his career uh, at HP, again doing Corp Dev, did a little side uh, uh, movement into, uh, into private equity at Opus Capital, and then came back into the Corp Dev world uh, within large companies at uh, Intuit, first as a vice president and now as the senior vice president of corporate strategy and development at HP. And Jamie Kim, Jamie Kim uh, graduated uh, from another one of my alma maters, great school, UCLA. Uh, and then uh, graduated from Wharton in 2014, uh, was part of a, of a startup, uh, did spend some time in an LBO with a company called uh, Platinum Equity, and spent a bunch of time in uh, venture capital, both in direct investing and fund of funds with California uh, Technology Ventures. Uh, and so uh, if I could just welcome my three panelists. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for uh, joining us today. <laughs> 
So I think the first thing, before we start talking about M&A specifically, um, I'd love to talk a little bit about the corp dev role and about the companies that you're currently with and what that corp dev role's like and how it's changed over your career. So mm -hmm. Vicente, I'll start with you. We'll just move, we'll move down the panel. Yeah, so uh, currently at V2 Ventures, which is um, a holding company of uh, different companies in the ad tech and marketing tech space that I'm working with a couple of other guys on, um, the corporate development role is um, kind of a hybrid, uh, uh, buying companies as well as um, um, helping with overarching portfolio strategy. So, um, uh, you know, incubating some companies, raising some money for some of the companies, and then, you know, eventually exiting some of the companies. It's, I think the ambition for my current role is kind of to uh, have like a, a Berkshire Hathaway within the uh, ad tech and marketing tech space. Um, in past roles uh, that I've been in corporate development positions in, or past companies that I've been in corporate development positions in, um, the roles have varied from being primarily um, buy side M&A focused um, to, uh, especially at the more early stage companies, um, being more of a, a general utility player where there might be some buy side M&A work, there might be some like finance and planning work, and then there might also be, uh, you know, work involving helping the companies, you know, ultimately sell, so. Fantastic. Anton? Yep. Uh, and first I just want to call out, I noticed you skipped over my BCG job. I don't know if that's a McKinsey <laughs> bias, but that was my I, first yeah. job post Wharton was at BCG for a couple of years. But it does actually tie in to Corp Dev. Okay. And as you pointed out, it, you're, you're spot on in what you said in the slides, strategy drives M&A. And when it doesn't, things tend to go horribly wrong. And so that background of strategy plus M&A plus venture it actually played a lot into the roles that I've had. Uh, at Intuit, uh, the role encompasses mostly m and I mean, the group I run is strategy and corp dev. And so we've got 30 people, about half do strategy, the other half do M&A and integration. And that includes, uh, on the corp dev side at least, mostly acquisitions, some divestiture, some minority investments. We have some LP investments in VC funds. And our mandate is uh, multifold, actually. It's one, to bring in really good talent into the, into the uh, business. So we have a ton of people who have come in through my group, which we call CSD, uh, which is named by someone who thinks the corporate modifier applies. It's corporate strategy and development, which mm. is strange. I may change it uh, someday, but uh, we bring in people, they go into the business, they've done phenomenally well. So we have some of the GMs came up through CSD. Uh, our second piece is driving growth through acquisition uh, and then managing the portfolio, so divesting as needed. Uh, and then also training the BU on things like negotiation, strategy, you know, taking the skills that we have that we're uniquely trained in and working with them. In my prior role, the one, I, I was at Intuit twice actually. So I was a VP for four years. I went to Square for two years, pre-IPO and then post. At Square, it actually encompassed more uh, because M&A wasn't, I mean, it was part of the role, but so was fundraising for Square Capital. So that was part of it. So was BizDev. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I worked on a lot of different things there uh, and now back at Intuit, it's, it's more of the M&A piece. Got it. And then Corp Dev is a wider role as you're bringing up, Anton. And you have a much broader role than just M&A in Corp Dev. Yeah, um, I think that lends to the fact that um, I'm at an earlier stage, sort of growth stage startup with 70 employees in Redwood City. But um, for me, you know, really it started as um, the board hiring me to help them through, um, help the company and the CEO specifically through um, capital raises. So really making sure that um, I had a hold on what was going on with the cash position, making sure that the company had the runway that it needed, um, developing a lot of relationships with a lot of corporate strategic entities who might give us non-dilutive financing, um, which could help you know, potentially fund internal projects uh, for our products as well. Um, so it, it, it encompasses almost a more business development function. Um, but also more of a capital markets position because um, being a CEO um, of a company that's growing as fast as we are, it's important to really make sure that you're you know, focusing your attention more on the customer acquisition side than you are on the cash balance and making sure that you're optimizing your capital structure um, and you know, fielding these inbound requests from different corporates who want to learn more about the business and keep a pulse of what you're doing in case they want to you know, either invest or um, ultimately, you know, as a sell side function, um, keep them interested in a potential um, acquisition. Fantastic. Let's spend just a few moments around um, each of the parts of the process. And then what we'll do is we'll, I'll ask them about uh, 20 minutes to discuss the process and we'll open it up uh, to the audience uh, for you guys to ask questions uh, as well. 
I would, you know, my, the bent I had today, and I could have talked all finance about valuation and so on, was this really the strategic bent? Because I think that, you know, M&A is just a tool, just like internal development and innovation is, in order to get you to where you want to go. So maybe you guys could just talk a few moments about, it could be Intuit, it could be one of the portfolio companies that you've worked with in the past or currently. Where, what, where is the company now and where do you want to take it? And how does M&A fit within that, that piece? And, and do you feel as if the company supports you in that, in that, in that M&A as, as an important tool or is this something that you have to fight for internally? I can start off and then. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I think, at least within the, the company that I'm currently in, um, I, re I report to the uh, majority owner. They're very supportive of, of M&A generally. I think that, you know, in terms of the overall strategy, I mean, I would characterize it as a super high level of, at a super high level at, um, you know, trying to move into attractive areas, make investments that have a high ROI and divest from areas that uh, uh, you know, we think are, are not growing or uh, areas that are unattractive. Um, and when you say attractive, what, you know, what, what makes something attractive to you as far as an area is concerned? Yeah, so I think it's, it's kind of a combination. I think um, you know, one, it has to be strategic. So you know, I think strategic is a loaded word. And uh, you, know, you, you can have whole you know, MBA classes on that. Um, but you know something that you know fits with the vision of the company that uh, you know there's uh, uh, you know s strong uh, uh, fit with the you know what what the company's capabilities are, uh, but, and then secondly you know I think just areas that are uh, uh, are big opportunities that have you know big market potential, big revenue potential. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. cool. Strategy, my friend. <laughs> yes, and Corp Dev. Um, so where are we today? I'll just the quick snapshot. So Intuit's a $5.2 billion business, growing 11-ish percent uh, with kind of mid-30s margin. So killer business driven by three segments, so consumer, self-employed, and small business. Uh, M&A is incredibly highly valued. So over, I, I should let you, I should have you guess, but what percent of our revenues come from acquisitions? It's actually over 60. Uh, it's because TurboTax was an acquisition. So that's a, it was a great one. We paid $225 million for it in 1993. It's probably worth $20 billion plus today. Mm -hmm. Um, and then our pro tax business was almost all acquisition and our payroll business. I mean, it's, they add up to big, big numbers. Uh, so huge support. My role reports directly to the CEO and that was by design from him because strategy and corporate dev is supposed to be seen as a seat at the table right next to the GMs. Uh, the way, the way that we focused is we work directly with each GM on their strategy. Um, they obviously drive it, but we're closely involved. And then we try to identify with them one, where do you want to be in two to three years? Two, where's the biggest gap in where we are today? And then three, which capabilities have that right set of integrations that makes sense for an acquisition? And there's an important piece there, uh, which is if you have something that's really integrated into the workflow, and one example from our history is inventory. So you can buy an inventory company, but it's so deeply integrated into accounting that it's actually really hard to buy something and plug it in. Uh, and so what we look for is things where if it's a backend data integration, sure, you can buy something that will keep working. Otherwise, you have to basically throw away the code and rebuild. So we think about things like that. Um, in each of our core spaces, we do have M&A initiatives. So uh, Global is a big push for us. We bought a company called Bankstream in the UK. It does data feeds, which is core to creating a competitive advantage. Uh, the company that we just uh, closed yesterday, T-Sheets, which was our fifth largest deal ever, uh, was a partner of ours. So it builds on our ecosystem. So these are all things that we look for. I think interestingly, while m and is considered incredibly important at Intuit, it's actually not required. And so when I talk about my goals with our CEO, he always says, I don't want you to have a number of deals goal because it's the worst incentive for an M&A guy to say, close a deal and that's a reward. It should be two years in, was this a good deal? Did you realize value? So that's how we measure success. Fantastic. So how do we create, so how do we get started? How do we create the set of companies? How do we screen the companies? And this is something that you've spent part of your career working on. So Jamie, how do, where, do I, where, do I, where do I start to see what that list looks like? And then how do we start the screening process yeah. once we've identified what we want our strategy to be? Um, so I think just um, kind of piggybacking off of though, also Which, just M&A, right? Um, it's interesting to mention that being from a starter, uh, a smaller growth stage smart, uh, startup, we actually, um, 
consider ourselves to be defining a new market because nobody, so what, what we do at Elacard is basically create software for the dining room space of a restaurant. And the way we like to think about things is that there's been a ton done in the back of house or the back of dining room experience, which is your POS systems, your inventory management, your kitchen display, and then an off premise, which is like your Uber Eats or your DoorDash or your um, open table for reservations. But nothing really has ever been done in terms of putting a digital layer in the front of house and the dining room experience, experience where 90% um, of your revenues are made. Um, and so it's a relatively new market. And um, you know, what, the way we think about it is that it's us and one other company that we don't even consider to be a real competitor in terms of product set. Um, but it's another company that does tablet you know, ordering and pay at the table. And um, what we found, we've been in the business for nine years, is that if they didn't exist, it would really put so much stress off of the pricing pressures, off of you know, um, the long sales cycles that we've been facing. And it's not until one of our companies really sort of pulls away from the market with a, you know, a product set that's going to be you know, far differentiated, are we going to find ourselves in a lot easier situations gaining market share. And so a lot of what you know, capital raising has been around has been around potentially knocking out this one competitor, and then you know, um, it, it would really significantly dis decrease sales cycles um, and a lot of these sort of bake-offs that we ever get into. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but, but of course, being you know, your balance sheet is not big enough, it's not really a consideration for us now. But um, as a company, the strategy is as our product kind of, again, pulls away from what they're doing, um, we hope that in the future, um, either we end up acquiring the business at an attractive price, right. or um, they just naturally die off. Right. And it sounds like your role most likely will change over time. Like right now, it's the Corp Dev role is focused mostly on fundraising. Right. But, so. So, and it gets back to the question I had before, which was, when do you think the company will have the appetite to start going down the M&A role? Because up until now, I assume they've had n nothing professional around corporate development before yeah, they brought you in. Absolutely. So um, I think that um, definitely in terms of raising big institutional rounds and getting um, strategic money into the company um, when the company is at that point and there are strategics that are interested. Um, so for instance, like um, legacy POS systems like an NCR or a Micros are interested in learning how we integrate POS but also add a consumer layer to it because now you have data from people who are um, making purchase decisions, but also you're getting the data from you know, the entire session that they're sitting in a dining room experience. Um, and so I think that um, you know, getting to a point where um, your company really is at a growth stage where you are going to be raising you know, large institutional financings and have the money to spend to um, you know, make sort of strategic investments of your own. All right, so back to the process. How do we how do we create this set of companies? How do we screen them? Right? How, you know, how do you start with, how many do you start with and how do you screen them down? Same thing. Yeah, I mean, at, at least the way I started, I think you know, everybody has their, you know, every corp dev team or every company has their own process. Um, you know, but once, once you've identified you know, those areas that you know, have high strategic fit and are attractive markets that you, know, you as a company want to be in and I think that's like you know collaborative process usually where you know corp dev teams are working with GMs and you know C-level executives and product leads to you know kind of figure out um, you know what segments of the, the ecosystem they they really want to focus on you know then you double click into the specific spaces and you know start creating a list of you know the different companies in the space and you know you sub segment them by different characteristics it could be you know, geography, number of employees, um, you know, product features, et cetera. And then, um, you know, it's kind of usually the corp dev person's job to, you know, go out and start um, talking to companies and, um, you know, having, you know, kind of initial screening calls where you figure out, you know, uh, a little bit more information about each company um, and then also find out like, you know, which entrepreneurs or CEOs are actually you know, interested in selling uh, at a particular time. And, you know, based on that analysis, you kind of, you know, you start this like feedback loop with your company where, um, you know, maybe the answer is that there's no, you know, really compelling acquisition target at the time, but, you know, it could be that, you know, there's a small set of companies that could be interesting and, you know, you start, you know, proceeding with further and further dialogues and due diligence um, to see if, 
you know, <coughs> there's an interesting um, acquisition target. That's at least been the way I've approached it. Anton, how much do you rely on your own team to create the set of companies and then to screen them down versus relying on you know, groups like BCG, for instance, or, yeah. or, the, or the investment banks and so on? Right. Um, it's, for us, almost all internal. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a great point that you're raising even by the framing of the question, which is the set of companies. I think in reality, for companies who aren't as experienced in M&A, a lot of times it's one company and they say, let's go buy that. Yeah. And the GM will push really hard and say, let's go get that. It will take an experienced corp dev person or someone who's got influence to say, that's not how this works. Uh, right. What are you trying to get? <laughs> and you can force them into a discussion. And yeah. I would say every time I've done that, you can find a better company that actually achieves the goal, but it takes some, some wrangling. Um, for us, the companies come a lot of times from the business. So, I mean, they'll know their partners, they'll know the companies in their space. Yeah. Uh, my team will do a lot of that, so screening databases and talking to companies. I would say we are very proactive in our approach, which is always best practice is strategy, look for companies and then buy someone, mm -hmm. versus being reactive. So if a banker sends us things, it's a really low hit rate. Occasionally there's serendipity and it works out, but. It's yeah, you bring up a point, and this is a, uh, a shout out to our, our vice dean. I'm a huge believer in tournaments. And, and a tournament means you're starting with a large set, yeah. not just one. Yeah. And you really, you look for a, a structured evaluation criteria and you let the best ones bubble to the top. And yeah. if you start with one, you're right. You, you almost create blinders that's exactly on it. whether or not that's the right one. Right. And how do you, what about uh, fit? You know, what makes a good fit? This is much, must be something you spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll answer and then obviously we'd love to hear from you guys too. For, for us, Fit is tricky because first you're trying to identify what are you actually looking for and fit means you know, whether it's talent, a tech tuck-in or a full running business, uh, there's different criteria on fit, but it's a well, what solves the problem the best and I'll focus on maybe kind of the smaller size tech tuck-in deal which is our most common type. So we were looking first for fit from a technical perspective, similar architecture, similar stack, did they solve the problem well, but then also one thing that we've learned over time is cultural fit matters more than you would think. We've had acquisitions go completely sideways because the team just didn't gel. And what happens is they just become this appendage and then you end up selling it off or shutting it down. And so now we look really hard for, is there a cultural fit here where they get our work style, they can fit into our culture, and that actually leads to far better outcomes for us. Fit for you guys? Yeah, I'd say other factors that are, you know I've found important um, are geography, so like, you know, you, you don't want to create endless new offices with, with m and so, you know, having geographic fit and being able to co-locate the acquired teams with your team is a nice plus. Um, then also, uh, the channel fit, I think, is, is really important where, um, you know, I think getting to one of the slides you put up just about, um, you know, one of the big rationales of m and being, um, you know, basically being able to cross-sell products or, um, bring higher value to existing customers. Um, you know, you, I think a lot of companies don't vet enough or don't value enough whether the, the acquired company actually, you know, sells to the same customers, has a similar value proposition to, uh, you know, what the acquiring company's value proposition is, um, you know, sells through the same channels that, that uh, your company. So I think that's that's one thing that I've come to appreciate more and more, um, having done more deals. Um, you know, so I can accredit more my experience working in an LBO fund, rolling up private companies, okay. which I mean, it's the name of the game is finding that cost structure, which is going to have synergies where you're going to find those cross-selling opportunities, um, and in a very rigorous way, making sure that you know, either you can co-locate with different uh, geographies coming together. Um, being able to knowledge share. So if you have like a CEO of a managed IT service company um, in Pittsburgh who, uh, you know, why is their cost structure in a certain line item so much lower than another? Are they using different products that, you know, you should be using, you know, as a substitute? You can knowledge share that. And so that ends up being, you know, a very powerful network when you're looking at companies to roll up together. All right, so you've screened the deal, you've, you've had this set of companies, you've broadened the, the sphere of your, your operational leaders. Um, you've, you've now narrowed it down to maybe one or two candidates. How do you start the negotiation process? And as part of that, especially for some of these young startups, how do you, how do you put a valuation on them? Especially, you know, that competitor you're talking about, right? 
So what do we do, guys? How do we, how do we uh, start the negotiation? How do you not tip your hand? That's what I was thinking, Vicente, when you were... You wrote, you wrote a book on valuation, so I think, you know, talking to you about valuation and how no, please. I've addressed I'm, it I'm is, trying uh, to learn. a scary, scary, uh, yeah. scary topic. I mean, I, I, you know, I have to admit, I think I've, you know, it, and I think a lot of companies, you know, fall into this trap. Um, you know, they don't approach valuation in as rigorous and... Um, uh, you know, proper of a, a way as they should. I think a lot of, uh, you know, companies that I've been at, you know, make assessments on how much to pay for a company, um, you know, based on things like multiples and other stuff like that, which, you know, are not necessarily best practice, but if, um, you know, you as a company are valued on those same metrics, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the easy temptation is to, you know, value other companies on those same metrics that, that you're being valued on. So, um, you know, I'd say, you know, in terms of how I approach valuation and negotiation, um, you know, I do try to stick to, I think, some of the, the fundamental learnings in your book. Uh, so <laughs> I try You, you, I try, you I got try the A already. I have a, cop, <laughs> I have a copy at my house still. You um, got the A already. Um, but, you know, actually, I think in the technology space, you know, valuation, and especially if you're looking at tech and talent deals or acquihires or really early stage deals, yeah. like valuation is extremely difficult. And, it, you know, having worked a little bit at venture firms as well, you know, I think a lot of the valuation kind of resembles, you know, how you approach a venture investment where, mm -hmm. um, you know, you look mm -hmm. at, you know, the, the market size that the company's addressing, you, you know, apply different probabilities based on different cases of, you know, what a, you know, successful outcome versus a conservative outcome could be. And, you know, you kind of, you know, take a Hail, Hail Mary pass and, you know, you, you, know right. you, you hope that it works out. And, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of times if you're doing early stage deals, like they, they don't work out, but, you know, sometimes they could be massive home runs. Um, and then from a negotiation standpoint, I think that's a different subject. I think, you know, that's, that kind of comes to the art of, um, you know, M&A where, you know, you feel out a situation, understand, um, you know, the cap table, you know, the situation and, you know, the, uh, the situation that the selling company is in, how competitive the, the bidding process is. And, you know, you, you, you know, triangulating all those factors and where your internal valuation is, you know, you try to figure out, you know, what the right initial offer is to put in. Anton, how do you start the how do you start the discussion? Because you can't just say, "Hey, it's Anton from Intuit." I mean, like yeah. the signal you send with just that, you know, those first two words. How do you start that yeah. conversation without signaling too much? Yeah, you, I guess there's a couple conversations that could over signal, and and I think you're raising a point, which is there's a huge risk in you know me calling or someone from the corp dev team calling and saying, "Hey, we want to talk," because that company, if they're any good, will say, "Oh, you want to buy us." Let me call your three main competitors and tell them I'm about to be bought by Intuit and start a whole negotiation process with all three of you, which we don't want. Right. And so we, all, we always start with the very cagey, let's talk about partnership, maybe more. And everyone knows what that means, but it's not so leaning in. And plus, we want to learn a lot before we actually get to an offer. By the time we go through that process of kind of the prelim diligence and you know, get their numbers and know what we want to pay, at that point, we're ready almost with an LOI. And we say, OK, it turns out we do want to buy you. Here's the offer, and again, we, we use all, all the techniques that uh, Vicente was talking about. We triangulate, um, and we, we take the approach of chance favor the, favors the prepared mind uh, in terms of negotiation, which is we have a script laid out with, with all the approaches we've used, why it's fair, and I would say that works in about 80 to 90% of cases. If people say like, wow, okay, this does seem fair, barring a competitive offer, which blows us out of the water. And if you, you go back to um, the, the, the laying the groundwork, I mean, I would assume there are companies that you've been in discussions with for a long time, not for acquisition, but just as you said, what are they doing? What's interesting? Developing those relationships over yeah. a long period of time so there's no surprises. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, I disagree with Paul Graham, who said, you know, if Corp Dev calls, don't answer, which I think is completely insane. Because if, if Corp Dev calls, it means that company is looking at your space. And it's incredibly important for you to at least know are they looking to buy? Are they just kicking tires? And the reality is when you do want to sell, and the vast majority of tech companies sell, they don't go public um, or they go bankrupt, but let's not talk about that scenario. Um, when you actually want to know the acquirer. So if a company calls me out of the blue and says, hey, we want to sell, I'm very skeptical, I pay bottom dollar, it's not the relationship you want to have. 
versus if you've known them for a while, you can say, you know, you guys are a good fit. We've known you, you're a partner ideally. We've run a test. There's all kinds of things you can do uh, that would make sense that lead to a better acquisition from a startup perspective. Now you've been, yeah, please go on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, you know, a lot of my job right now is sort of managing these corp dev and corporate relationships. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it usually comes under the pretenses of also corporate venture being interested in what you're doing. Yeah. And you know, they kind of see that as at the front end, maybe if we put in an investment, we can stay on top of what you guys are really doing. And then if it becomes interesting enough, you know, we'll be close enough where we could sort of get first dibs on something like this. Um, and so, um, you know, given that we are an incredibly new space um, that covers sort of um, a wide swath of different industries, such as, you know, POS or like a, a beer, you know, a beer product company might want to use us because we hold a lot of consumer preference data. Um, whereas before, their only way, you know, one beer company came to us and said, the only way that we can know whether product A or product B is doing better is by taking our beer to Coachella Weekend 1 and then taking our beer to Coachella Weekend 2 and then just doing some sort of AV analysis, right? Which is right now, what we're able to do is, you know, give you like a real heat, heat map of, you know, who's ordering what beverage um, in every city of the United States. And so, um, you know, a lot of the job is sort of entertaining these big, you know, corporates who are coming in under the auspices of let's just build a relationship, maybe for corporate venture, maybe for, you know, you know, talk to one of our business units. But, um, you know, we do see that as being, you know, the start of a long relationship and who knows what that ends up being. All right. So let's say that you have uh, now completed your negotiation. Uh, you already feel pretty good because you've done the screening process appropriately. So you feel that there's going to be a, a chance for, uh, for a good fit. Now you're ready to start the integration process as you bring people on board. It's tough. I, I don't know if there's any playbook towards a successful integration. So where do you start? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, 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 Anton and Jamie's approach uh, to integration as well. I mean, I think that as, as tough as getting an M&A deal uh, done is, um, I feel like integration is as if not more challenging. And that's really where um, you know, the value is captured. So, you know, if, if you don't do that right, like you, uh, you know, totally destroy all the, the good negotiation and strategy work that you did up front to get the deal done. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, having seen a lot of different companies and, you know, studied, you know, not only, you know, what I've done from an integration perspective, but also, you know, best practices out there in terms of, uh, you know, what, you know, other technology companies like Google and, you know, Cisco and Oracle and others have done right. Um, you know, I, I've come to believe that, I guess there, there are a couple of best practices. I would say that, um, you know, one, starting integration, you know, as early, or integration planning as early as possible um, is very, is a very good thing. So a lot of companies, you know, wait too long, like a week before the, you know, acquisition is closed to, you know, start really doing, you know, deep integration work. And, you know, I think uh, a lot of the, the successful acquirers, um, you know, have, have, you know, do more front loading of that work. And I think that's like, you know, now becoming more of a best, best practice where, you know, basically like right after the, the term sheet is signed, um, you know, while you're parallel tracking due diligence and definitive agreement negotiation, like you're also like, you, you know, really stress testing, you know, what the post-close integration will, will look like. Um, and then two, I would say that, uh, you know, not having a cookie cutter approach to uh, integration is a good thing. I think if, if a company, you know, really closely aligns with your product capabilities, your technology set, um, you know, maybe you could have like a fulsome integration where, you know, you, put all of the acquired um, employees, acquired companies' employees into the respective functional areas within the parent company. And, um, you know, the acquired company, you know, totally, you know, merges into the parent company. But um, especially as you diverge, you know, I, I, this is a, maybe a personal belief, not backed by academic research, but um, I think that as you diverge from what your core capabilities are, I think, you know, doing a really deep integration risks um, messing the acquired company up. And so, um, you know, there are a few case studies that I look to of like, whether it's like, you know, 
the Instagram acquisition and the consumer world or the YouTube acquisition and the consumer world to um, you know, some of the acquisitions that, or the acquisition approach that some of the big enterprise software companies take, uh, which is um, you know, maybe you know, integrating them through your distribution channels or go-to-market channels, but you know, otherwise maybe keeping the acquired company relatively mm -hmm. standalone to not mess it up too much. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, agree with all of that. <laughs> We've gotten to the point where integration starts even before we sign the LOI. So when we go to our CEO and CFO to get approval to go negotiate, we'll have a straw man integration approach. We have an internal integration team who does this. Because uh, they want to know how committed is the BU, how much have they thought about this. Mm -hmm. I think it's another huge mistake uh, that you guys have pointed out from acquirers is they buy a company, aren't sure how they're going to integrate it, or they think of integration as laptops and badges, which it's not. I mean, that's, that's a very tiny part of it. It's a lot more about thinking of why are we buying this company? Even if it's an aqua hire, we've had cases or I've seen them where you buy a team and someone didn't ask the question of what are they going to work on? So yeah, they're really smart engineers, but where's this team going to go? And so we force those discussions to happen up front that you know exactly what you're gonna to do to achieve that outcome, and then we track it for two years, post, and report to the board every quarter. So there's, there's real teeth behind it. Any issues around integration? You know, my in experience with integrations have been really just two big failures, <laughs> which, because it was really more like two venture-backed startups and the institutional VC wanting to put them together, um, either to give them a fighting chance, because they were both not doing well, or, um, you know, uh, this idea that, you know, we had this one company that was like a video game development platform that we wanted to merge with like this art company that created digital assets in China. And because the actual um, thesis of the company itself was so early, um, you know, obviously merging the two of them didn't end up working out anyways. And you know, you weren't profitable, you're just waiting for more equity money to come in, which it doesn't, and then mm -hmm. that's that, and so. If I look back at uh, integration, and, and one thing that I think can, can help, and I'd love to hear your perspective on it, the person that's gonna run the integration, two things about them. Number one, I think they need to be involved early in the process, because handing it off to someone who feels as if they weren't part of that original negotiation process mm -hmm. is gonna put distance between them in a, in a negative way. And number two, it has to matter to them. I mean, professionally, from a career standpoint. I would love to be able to go and say, if you get this right, everybody's gonna notice, because you're gonna be the one that put these two companies together to make it successful. Any perspectives on you know, who, run, who eventually takes over that, that helm as, as the integration lead yeah. you know, for, for, for whatever acquisition you've just done? Uh, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with your, your two points. Um, uh, I think having you know, some designated like integration lead who um, you know ideally you know is involved in due diligence so they understand you know and even like the the m a case development where they understand like what what the key reasons were for like why this company was even bought and you know they're kind of like up to speed on the company's issues and you know not just learning about the company when like the deal is announced like i think that's uh, a definite best practice and then um, uh, you know, secondly, like, you know, having somebody that's in charge of the deal and ideally, like, you know, has, uh, you know, some metrics, to, you know, yeah. uh, tied or, you know, they, they, uh, they're accountable to, to some of the post-close metrics, I think is, is key to making the deal successful. Yeah. I think the other thing, they've got to have the right personality. So okay. it, it, you're spot on. They should come from the BU. So it can't be a central corporate function. It's got to be the business who's buying it has to really own it. We've had cases where a GM will say, no, no, I got this, it's on me. It's like, not really, you're running a two and a half billion dollar business. So you're not focused on this hundred million dollar small thing. There's no way you're gonna focus the time. So pick one of your rock stars. So when you're highest rated people and put them on it, because we're spending you know, X hundred million of dollars. Uh, and that happens now, which is great. So people are now pulling out, you know, here's a rock star. Let's take her out of her role, tell her she's gonna be in Boise four days a week, which probably isn't her favorite thing to do. Uh, but it's because there's all kinds of incentives behind it, which is if you make this work, this is going to be huge for you and your career. And, and that person also has to have kind of the velvet glove, uh, a velvet fist approach, which is really good relationship builder, able to bond with this new company, but also make sure they hit the metrics, make sure that they're doing what Intuit needs them to do. So there's, there's a lot of managing uh, from that perspective. Yeah, probably 25 years of corporate development experience. Let's hear what you guys have to say. Yeah, please. 
How do you balance the need for disclosure concerns when you're uh, potentially acquiring a company with developing a straw man and balancing the concerns of, you know, basically tipping your hand, but getting the necessary information and planning that you want to have to really have a good uh, acquisition strategy? Great question. Yeah. Great question. Uh, I'll take a first stab at it. Uh, so, and you mean disclosing internally or externally? Internally. Inter yeah. So, uh, I tend to take a really constrained approach to it. I think deals can leak really easily. And so we kind of take a small core team uh, at first. So all the way up to LOI, it's kind of five, six people maybe who know about the deal. I mean, outside of yeah, the CEO staff. Uh, but from the business, everybody has this instinct that they want to pull in their whole team and they all want to talk about it and m and is exciting. And it's, it's an interesting instinct, but it's always wrong. And so. <laughs> We really pull it in and say, look, you need to have five or six dedicated people who can make the call on this. You can't delegate it. And post LOI, then depending on the size of the deal, we'll either say, yeah, let's disclose a slightly broader group. And usually it's not more than 15 or 20 total to do diligence. And there's corporate functions who are dedicated to M&A, so they know the, the rules of the road. Uh, for bigger deals, depending on how big it gets, for anything that's really impactful, we occasionally will have people, kind of, you know, if it's 50, 60 people on the diligence team, uh, which occasionally it is, we'll have them sign an internal NDA and just make sure they know that this isn't a normal partnership deal. Uh, I think that's one of the big challenges is M&A is usually unique. It's not, you know, most companies don't do it every day and people get involved and they treat it like, a, oh, this is cool. I'm going to tell like the people I work with that I'm working on this acquisition of X company. And a lot of times, like in our most recent deal, it's a partner and it'd be really damaging to them if it leaked that we were buying them or if, if God forbid, it leaked and then we didn't do it. So there's all kinds of issues that we try to, to manage. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Peter. In terms of uh, the integration itself, do you guys actually have valuation metric to put price on the integration cost itself? In terms of, is there some adjustment or is it more soft? Uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, that should factor into your, uh, your deal model. Like, I think, like, mm -hmm. like, ultimately, you know, you should come up with some kind of, like, you know, P&L or, you know, forecast for, whatever company you're requiring and, um, you know, whatever additional cost comes in via, you know, integration or, or otherwise, I think should be factored into uh, your business case for doing the deal. Yeah, yeah same here. It's, we have a, an op mech, uh, it's called the CFO commit, where we go in, talk to the CFO, we say, here's the PL we're gonna get from this deal based on this price, the ROI is X, we have a 15% threshold. And so basically the GM looks the CFO in the eye, I think this may have come from Bill Campbell or one of our board members said, you have to do that, where they actually commit and say, I'm gonna hit these numbers. Yeah. Uh, and then every quarter we check in on that too. So it's, there has to be teeth behind it and it has to be a number where we say, if you hit this, we're good. If you don't, we're now get, not getting the return on M&A that we thought we would. Yeah, please, oh, right here, yes. Yes, uh, my question is about the cycle time of a transaction and how this can affect the, the business case because in a technology company, you know, competition can, you know, change quickly. What is your average transaction time in doing M&A mm -hmm. from analysis to integration? Two to five year process, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> multi, multi year. Uh, depends where you start from. If it's from, hey, I've got an idea, I want to buy in this space. I mean, that upfront process can take a long time. From initial outreach, uh, I'll give you our metrics uh, that I push my team for and we hit it sometimes, sometimes we don't. Initial outreach to LOI should be 30 days or less for the exact point that you're raising is, I don't want to give people time to go shop the offer. I want them to sign up and be an exclusivity with us. And then from LOI to closed, it's usually 60 days or less depending on size of the acquisition. And then closed to integrated two years, again, depending on size, could be less. Yeah, but I think, like actually, I mean, since the start of this conversation was about strategy, um, like I found that that can be like, the, you know, kind of the, uh, the gating item where, uh, you know, you as a company might know that, you know, some broad concept like, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning is tremendously important to the future of your company. But, you know, it takes a long time for, you know, you as a company to get internal alignment around, you know, what does that specifically mean for our company? You know, how should we address that with our product? You know, what are, you know, what should we look to acquire to, to solve this? And, you know, by the time that like you as an, ex you know, a, a company have answered that question, you know, there might've like, 
the most attractive companies and you know that uh, you know address that topic might have already been acquired you know six months ago and um, you know so I've found like you know that's that's one of the biggest issues that contributes to long cycle time and um, I don't think there's a way around it I think you do need to to do that work I think it, you know ideally you know use a company have sound you know ongoing strategic planning and strategic decision making processes where you know that strategic rationale development for M&A doesn't become a gating factor or something that's a huge uh, hold up to you know, doing deals in a highly competitive environment. Um, I can add to that. So um, I think a lot of what you see with this sort of um, rise of corporate venture also has been from the learnings that you do want to get in earlier than later. And so you're starting to see a lot of these sort of old traditional companies um, like an Amway or Kellogg um, now forming corporate venture funds. And you know this is so, again, they know that some kid in a garage isn't going to come and completely disrupt their business. And um, you know, a lot of, you know, and I was mentioning now there are even funds that are like the outsourced venture funds for all these different corporations because corporates don't have experience in venture or investing in, in companies. Mm -hmm. um, but they know that it's a really integral part of you know, the mm -hmm. future strategy of the company and understanding what's going on, especially in a technology company. Um, and so you know, you, you'll see you know, that sort of parallel with this rise of corporate venture, and everybody has a corporate venture fund now. How about uh, two more questions, and I'll ask you guys a question. One and two right here. Yeah, please, one and then two. Oh, so um, going back, if, if you're in the business where you are trying to pivot, but you're trying to pivot into something which is pretty hot, and so you have a very competitive market of, of the targets, how do you identify targets when big fish is like Accenture's going after all these acquisitions? How do you identify something, and then how do you value it in that kind of competitive market? Can you give an example? So, I can hear you. <laughs> Yeah, so I think same principles apply as in standard deals. I agree with you, it's just a more competitive market. Uh, so AI is a great example. That there's kind of these cycles of what kinds of talent and tech are more exciting, and say five to seven years ago it was mobile, and so mobile engineers were impossible to come by, and we'd go out and look to acquire them. I hate acquihires, generally it feels like if somebody wants to join your company, they should join. You shouldn't have to pay them a million dollars ahead, but um, the current space is AI, and people are going to pay up for that. And you know, there are companies out there fighting for it, but what we look for is, I mean, we'll do a scan, there's a ton of companies out there. Uh, there are some that fit kind of our needs better, so FinTech AI is far more relevant for us, as an example, than other types of AI. And so we'll look for very specific things. Uh, a lot of times with AI, it's not a, pla I mean, just building on the example, it's not a technology as much as a skill set that you need, because if you have, you know, for us, 35 million tax returns and 5 million SMBs and lots of data flowing through accounting and tax, uh, you just need someone who can actually operationalize it and apply AI to it and look for the right signals. So that's how we do it. And then valuation often comes down in those cases where it's a hot space to more competitive pricing than uh, you know, comps and things like that. How about one more up here, yeah. Um, my question is regarding the evaluation of a two-year two old acquisition. So, uh, do you set the criteria beforehand, and then do you prioritize the criteria according to the um, acqu uh, acquiree? Uh, is this post acquisition? So, so, so ba basically, you're acquiring someone tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you say today, in two years, we're going to evaluate if this worked according to, let's say, profits, technology, mm -hmm. uh, integration, uh, backend, whatever. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's good to benchmark yourself, or benchmark the deal's performance based on objectives that you set before the deal's done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's that's how I've always uh, measured the success of. Yeah, same here. We we literally have quarterly benchmarks for every all those metrics. So there's employee metrics, financial metrics, product metrics, 
And each one, you want to set them before you go in, otherwise it'll be kind of a false look back. And not only do we set them ourselves, we then get buy-in from the target before we close. Because the worst thing is to close a deal and say, okay, FYI, we got to hit $180 million next year and have them say that that's impossible. Uh, so we get every, everyone bought in first and then say, do we hit it or not at the end? So I'm going to turn it around for the last point. Rather than asking these guys a question, because we'll still be around after the session, there's probably a thousand years of acquisition history in the audience. And many of you, if not all of you, could have been just as easily up on this panel. So I'm going to ask for three volunteers, maybe one from each section. If you could tell me one thing that you've learned about M&A in your career that you would impart to, let's say, our students, you know, what would that one thing be? From my audience. Start in the top row in the middle. We'll, we'll give you a mic so everyone can hear you. Oh, yeah, I, I've worked at two cloud companies. I work at for Ring Central now, previously Proofpoint. I've been through like eight different acquisitions, right? So, on the last, you know, one thing that really stands out that we didn't discuss here is, you know, companies build up, you know, knowledge and experience with acquisitions over time, right? So, you know, doing your fifth acquisition is very different than doing your first one, right? Yeah. So, when we do our, in my company's own, we did our first acquisition, like, we didn't know, like, exactly like how to sell the product, right? We, we went in and we thought, hey, you know, the customer kind of looks like our existing customer, right? And we were selling to email administrators, but we have found out very quickly that the email administrator for your internal email for your exchange email is very different than the one for your gateway email, right? Which is for your, um, like your anti-spam, right? So one was a very short 30 day, 60 day sales cycle. One was a nine month to a year long sales cycle. So we ended up having to build out a whole new sales team for that, All right? So that's something that we did, All right? Second thing that we ran into was uh, when you look, when you're setting benchmarks, like when you buy a company and you put in all these requirements, you know, that the, the team needs to meet to meet their uh, to meet their cash out or their bonus, it's like it can actually lock them into not working on other things that come up in your business strategy, right? You know, business change. Right, so six months later, nine months later after acquisition, the business landscape has changed. You want to do something else, but this team is locked into you know, achieving that goal yeah. that they set when they were acquired. Right, so going forward, we actually look to make, actually uh, add a little bit more flexibility. That's a, yeah, that's good. Very good point. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Two more volunteers. What's the one thing you've learned about M&A after the experiences that you've had? Yes, please, right uh, in the middle here, right there. Yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, we, we've been acquiring a few companies in different countries. Uh, we have followed from, you know, the very in-depth planning and trying to follow uh, the best practices, but I think uh, culture, and you mentioned that, is, is very, very important having uh, integrations, especially when the integrations work with the people that is things alike and can blend with your company easily, it, it facilitates everything. Is there any way to test it or is it just conversations that you have between the leadership that, te that, that tries to really get at you know, the motivations of people and the value systems and so on? I think it's both. It's, it's uh, getting to know the leadership, getting to know how they treat the people working for them, it's very important see them in action, you know, in, ask them to invite you to meetings where to see how they are managing the business day to day and getting to know how they deal with people, especially if, if your culture is, is in a way that you are looking for those things. And that, that's very important because in one case, I mean, the, the, the management was, seemed to be good, but uh, after that, we saw that it was completely different to what we want. Okay. So, uh, so that, that for me, is, I think, is, is the one thing I, I think is very important. Thank you. And I think that you raise your, raise your hand over there as well. So our final volunteer of the night. Honored. Yeah, so we're in a really interesting space. We're in the sports camp space in the company I work for. And because we're in that space, we're, we're one of the few you know, major buyers. We have the largest network. And so we, we buy a lot off revenue. And we get in trouble doing that, just focusing on one metric and not really having the same integration plans that you need to have, whether it's a private company, whether it's a, a big public company. 
um, a lot of these things matter. Asking all the right questions, even if it seems like a, you know, home run, slam dunk, plug and play, perfect fit for your company, your culture, a lot of things can go wrong. So be meticulous about it. Having a strategy, having buy-in from the relevant people, the integration yeah. team is all just essential, even, even in, you know, smaller market stuff. Yeah, you know, I have to say, I, I, that's one thing I have learned as I've grown older. Uh, when I was doing this professionally, I think sometimes I took due diligence as a check the box. I, if I look back when I was younger, you had your list and you sort of checked the boxes versus I think today if I were to go back and do it again, I would be a pit bull. I'd be a private investigator. I would take nothing for granted because, you know, if you start digging deeper, especially as you move into emerging markets, the initial impressions that you get and what you're being sold is never truly what's what's happening and I think that my mindset has changed as maybe as I've gotten a little older and a little bit more jaded all right so everybody thank you very much uh, as I said from the very beginning we really appreciate you guys coming back I would hope that you would do everything you can to get the message about what we're trying to do here at Wharton to the broader uh, um, Silicon Valley community. It's just so important for us. It, it drives me crazy when I tell someone that we have a, a place out here on the West Coast and they say, really, you do? The answer is we do, and it's powerful. And so anything you can do to help spread our message, we really appreciate it. I also want to thank my panel one more time, Vicente, uh, Anton, Jamie. Thank you for taking time out of your night. Really appreciate it. And to our entire team at Wharton, led by Carl. Carl, thanks for giving us the opportunity to do this. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Carl. All right, I, I have nothing more to say. Thanks so much for coming. I'll get the swag out. So thanks so much. Happy New Year. Take care. Happy New Year, everybody. Right. Thank you very much.